Hey guys, welcome to the Power Public Podcast. This is a new venture for us into the world of podcasting. And over the next few months, we're going to be welcoming prominent guests from the world go-kart racing. In today's episode, we're talking to Mark Wicks, the founder of the very popular karting website, Kart Sport News. We have a great conversation with him about his experience in racing everything from go-karts to race cars and what led him to a successful career in go-kart journalism. We pick up the conversation about the emergence of the Rotax engines here in Australia in the late 90s and early 2000s and Mark's experience at the Rotax World Finals. Let's get into it. Yeah, Rotax engines, oh, I, I love them. I reckon they're great fun when they, they hit the power. It's, it's wicked, especially the latest Evo engine. But I wasn't around when they first dropped here in Australia because I was on, like I said, having a bit of a hiatus. So, yeah, to, if you've got any insights into the um, early days of Rotax racing. Yeah, be- from what I, I recall of it, um, they it was sort of late 90s and I was working for the Card Oz magazine at the time, yeah. actually, and, and DPE was the distributor of the Rotax product at that point. And I remember they had um, Mark Weber come down to have a play around in in one at the Todd Road track in uh be about around 99, 2000, I'm guessing. Was he super when, famous? F1 it was just Dr. after he'd been days. doing his backflips in the Mercedes at the line. Oh, uh, yeah. Anyway. Right. Yeah, yeah, because he had uh, he was very fussy about you not to show any Mercedes logos. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he had to drive around. But at that stage, the Rotax was a bit of a dog to drive. It was really boggy in the low. They hadn't sorted out um, – I guess carburetor settings and all of that sort of stuff as much as what they, I mean, it's very much comes out of the box and you run it and it goes well these days, but it wasn't so much the case back then. Um, So yeah, that was sort of the late nineties. And then the first grand finals was in 2000 and that was in Puerto Rico. And because I was working for Cardoz magazine um, and, and Rotax at that point funded a person from the national press in all of the different countries that had Rotax drivers coming to the world final. So nice. basically got oh, a trip okay. to Puerto Rico yeah. <laughs> for the first one. And, and um, there was a bunch of Aussies that went over um, and Kiwis as well. And uh, William Yarwood got third at the first really? grand finals, which yeah. a lot of people, because it's so long ago now, people don't realize that, you know, what some of some people have done there. Yeah, shout out to Big Willie at Project X. Yeah, he's um, yeah, yep. he's quite the peddler. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I wasn't around then, so I you know obviously didn't see how good Big Willie got in the later years of his racing, and I knew he was a big fan of the road tax. Um, now you said you went to the road tax World Finals, the first one that was Puerto Rico, was it? Yes. Yep. And then, did you say you you went to the second one as well, or a third one? Uh, no, I didn't go to the second one, but a few years uh, the second one was in. Malaysia, I think it was. I can't remember the exact yeah, venues sure. and sequencing of it all, but uh-huh. I ended up um, qualifying as Australia's Masters driver for the 2003 World Finals. Uh-huh. And at that stage, um, the World Finals were basically run in January of the following year. Yeah, right. uh, it's not. It was not quite as tight as what it was now. And uh, yeah, I ended up getting um, that, at that point. The Masters division was part of just the Rotax 125 class. It was just like a race within a race. And I ended up coming eighth overall in the Rotax final uh, and first Masters driver home. Oh, so uh, technically pretty, pretty world champion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't, don't tell the FIA. No, no, no way, but you know, just claim it. You buy yeah. yourself a big trophy, stick it on your wall. So, and- well, the funny thing was that with <laughs> You had, there was a podium presentation and all that sort of stuff, but there was no first, second, or third place trophies. They just gave you uh, like a, a a silver plate thing to say you've been to the world finals. <laughs> Only the top three sort of got one. But, like an uh, encouragement award. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I, I think Rotax at the time were more looking at um, – they were – they weren't promoting it as the Olympics of karting, but they were sort of along that theme. It was more about the participation of it rather than the getting too aggressive on the competition side. Uh, but I mean, that's changed over the years. It's uh, it's become a, a, a big deal. Yeah, it is. Yeah, subsequent years, and that uh, it's a bit of a funny story, of not so much funny, but um, as far as qualifying for the final, uh, the at the time Australia didn't have a pro tour. At that yeah, point, right. yeah, and it was just a Rotax Nationals, and whoever was the highest placed at the Nationals earned the drives. And um, it's the one-off race meeting Nationals, a one-off race meeting, yeah. yeah. And it was at Newcastle. Always? Uh, no, no. This the, for the one that I qualified through. It was at Newcastle. Ah. Fantastic track. Yeah. Up there, uh, yeah. Mount Sugarloaf. 
And um, the funny thing was I had the worst race meeting I've ever had in my karting career and qualified for the biggest race meeting that I ever won <laughs> because uh, that was a full field. I had a terrible race meet, blue engines up, crashed, all sorts of things. Just now, this is a master or as just Rotax? No, oh, this was, it was as part of, uh, again, just part of the Rotax light, I guess it was called at the yeah. time. Uh, and there was master's drivers in it. And I didn't even qualify for the final at Newcastle. Yeah, okay. The, the funny thing was that my competition in Masters that had an even bigger shit weekend than what I did. And I ended up the <laughs> highest. There's more misery <laughs> place. those guys. Yeah, so I've, it was embarrassing to qualify that way, but I hit the, ticked the criteria off I was. Off yeah, well, you, maybe you'd run out of media passes. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. I had to do it some other way. <laughs> Free trips. Now, um, yeah. you were saying that also too, that you used to be able to bring your own chassis to a world finals. What did you do there? Did yeah. You- the, the first number of world finals, the competitors had to um, supply their own carts. Now, I think Rotax and the distributors organized the shipping of them and, and that sort of stuff. Um, and the one that I raced at was, I think it was the final one where that happened because mm-hmm. uh, the this was in Egypt and it was the first time they ran Junior Max and they had CRG supply chassis for the juniors. And uh, and I think that was sort of the, the the test to see how that would work, and it worked really well. So from that point onwards, every time there's a Rotax World Final, all of each category has always been on the same chassis. Yeah, and okay. Just from a logistical point of view, it was just much easier for the Rotax to just coordinate that one thing than everything coming from different countries. Yeah, I was going to say, like, so if you ordered your frame, did, you, did it come from, say, like Italy, the manufacturer, or you just send it from Australia and they just – Picked up the shipping tabs. Well, what what I what I had done, um, I was <laughs> using a, a friend's cart uh, in what was it, two thousand and three, and just running uh, the Golden Power series here in Victoria, just to yeah. get some race miles up. Thinking, oh, you know, there's there's a small chance I could qualify for the world final. I better do some racing again because I was out of out of racing at that point. I wasn't doing any competition. Oh, okay. And so I thought, oh, we'll have a bit of a run. And uh, it was an old Swiss Hutless cart. It was a and a friend of mine, Mike Monday, was helping with me uh, to get to the race meetings and uh, and just get miles in the thing. And we ended up winning the power series. But um, the cart was too old to be eligible <laughs> to, to go to this world final because they were wanting uh, carts to be CIK homologated. Okay. And, and this was too old for that. And so um, DPE being the distributor, at the time, Bart Price was to be the Australia's driver. Okay. And, at it. So DPE were organising the shipment of the carts, and I basically said to DPE, look, rather than me have to supply all bits and pieces and get another cart and spares, et cetera, Bart's going, you're putting an arrow in, just put two of everything. Yeah. Much easier. Put on, and put it on Bart's table while you're at it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out Bart ended up didn't racing. Adrian Astasi ended up being the driver. There was some licensing issues with 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 Bart at the time. But, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a fantastic event. And um, DPE were really good to help coordinate all of that. And where was that one at? It was in Egypt at oh, Egypt. Shamel Sheikh. Yeah. Yeah, right. It was near the F1 circuit or? No, it... no, it was down on the, um, it's down <laughs> about, oh, right. about a half hour flight from Cairo. South. Yeah. Um, it's on the, oh, I can't remember the name like of the. Persian the, Gulf. The, the Dead Sea, the Red Sea yeah. or something. Uh, I'm not too sure. Yeah. Anyway, the, where we were was a renowned, it was had all of these big, uh, massive um, hol- uh, tourist uh, resorts. Oh, and okay. so the circuit was just a, a two kilometer bus trip from the, the resort and, and everybody, we, everybody at that event stayed at the one place. So oh, there was a really great vibe about it all. Yeah, you damn. Could bump, bumping into race people when you're out having a, a, a drink or a party at night was great. Yeah. yeah. Especially if you've already bombed out of the heat races, you can be yeah. outside, you know, <laughs> trying to make up for yeah, it. Yeah. Well, I was being all very serious up to the point after, until after the meeting, then, then, then sort of let a little bit loose, got thrown in <laughs> the, the pool. The clubs are off. <laughs> <laughs> the true Aussie comes out <laughs> at the bar, bit messy. Um, that, that's uh, probably one of the things that, is good about, I guess, Rotax racing. They go to a different country every year. Um, like you said, you went to Egypt. I mean, I've never been to Egypt. To be honest, plenty of other people wouldn't have either. Yeah, well, I I wouldn't have been been there, and and, and um, I'm not one to sort of go on overseas trips. So it was uh, it was it was an opportunity that um, that I was lucky to very lucky to have. 
Yeah. Did you did you end up staying for like another week or so to do a bit of No, um I had to get back to Australia. We we did a I think there was a, like a day in Cairo to the museum and the and 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 go out to the pyramids and that sort of stuff. So I did get to see a couple of the the um the key tourist attractions, but uh, no, didn't didn't get to do a holiday as such. And what was the the track surface like over there? Asphalt. Yep. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, but like, uh, no, it, the, the track was actually pretty or? good. It, yeah, yeah, real, really dusty, and and that probably played into my advantage a little bit because if it had been a circuit like when they run in Italy, and it's a high grip track with lots of rubber down and all of that sort of stuff, sure. because that's not something that I would have been used to. Would I would have struggled if it was at a venue like that? But being in Egypt, where the circuit was basically a high cart track, yeah, and and parts of it were really tight, but parts of it were pretty quick as well, and. um and, and the track got grippier as the event went on, but yeah, it was not a high grip surface, so that played into my hands really well. Yeah, hence you know the the rigged event on the way in, the rigged event at the <laughs> <laughs> victory. Yeah, yeah, it was a conspiracy. <laughs> well, that that's a that's a little bit of history of your road tax racing, but like, yeah. uh, when did you start? Just to give people a little bit of background, like yeah. when did you start kart racing, and and how did you get involved? Um, um, I started in 1983. Yeah, right. And I, whatever, however old I was then, teenager. Yeah. Kid. And um, the there was an advert in the local newspaper saying there's some people wanting to start a go kart club in the area, which is down. I was uh, my hometown is a little head town called Yanar in Gippsland in South Victoria. Uh huh. And um, there was an ad in the paper to say people interested in joining a go-kart club or creating a go-kart club didn't exist at the time uh, to go along to a, 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 um, some hall. Uh, and I went along to that and ended up being a founding member of uh, what's now become the Gippsland go-kart club. Oh, yes. So I haven't been a member continuously for the whole time, but sure. I was one of the uh, first members. Yeah. Oh, geez. So they haven't yeah. made you a life member because, you know, you were. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not overly active as far as being running with the club. I mean, it's still my home club, but I don't live down in Gippsland yeah, anymore. Sure. So yeah, uh, I get back there and race uh, from time to time. Still do club day racing down there. Oh, so you still uh, don the boots? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which are falling apart. I need to get some new ones. <laughs> Sponsorship opportunity, yeah, Alpine Stars. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I'm just doing club racing really on the cheap at, at the moment. Yeah, just, just <laughs> good to, luck with that. Get some numbers. <laughs> yeah. yeah, cheap and karting generally not the two words synonymous with each other. No, no. I mean, it's still a cheaper form of motorsport. Oh, but for it's, sure. Um, yeah, it's but it's a bit different now compared to what it was. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So you're 83. Yes. You. Yeah. You so started there, and, started. and I I just had a um. It was just a paddock cut at the time with a mower, motor, you know, like lawnmower engine on on the thing. Victor. And yeah. Yeah. And uh, they were putting the club in combination with uh, I can't remember the other club in Melbourne. They ended up promoting a street meeting. Oh, well, in a car park actually. Yeah. And and me not knowing anything really about the sport at that time, I've rocked up with this hire cut basically paddock cut yeah. thinking, Oh, I'm going to go oh, racing yeah. and all these people turn up with race cuts. So I'm thinking, Oh geez, mine doesn't really look like that. It almost sounds <laughs> like your entry into the road tax finals as well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, trend forming here. Mike. Yeah. Um, so that was a bit disappointing because I just, I mean, it was not a race cut that I had. So anyway, things evolved and I've sort of been involved on and off ever, ever since. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and what are some of those? Uh, so you said you were a teenager. Did, you, did your dad help you get into it, or you just? No, no. I've just. I don't know why. I've all, just always been interested in in car racing. Uh huh. And um, there's no real history of it in the family at all. Um, we had thinking back. We had neighbours across the road who used to be in Speedway. So maybe as a kid, I've seen the Speedway cars and they're they're colourful and noisy and all of that sort of stuff. And maybe that sort of uh, triggered an interest or something, but. Um, no, I've just, just always wanted to go racing. And then this thing come up in the newspaper about a go-kart club. And I thought, Ooh, yeah, that, that sounds good. No bogans in your family then? No. Oh, I, had, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Aussie term guys, just saying. Yeah. But another, another thing that, and you don't really see this much at all. It was sort of a few things happened at the same time. Um, the, you know, regional towns used to have street parades. Uh -huh. All the various organisations. Okay. Sure. There was a couple of go karts being towed in the street parade, 
And uh, that was something that triggered. I thought, oh, that looks interesting. I don't know where they were from or what they were, but they were race cars. And then we went to the Royal Melbourne Show uh, and the Victorian Karting Association had a display on there where they had um, the, do you recall the old What Are You Doing This Weekend printed brochures? No, I don't think so. Uh, no. Oh, well, they used to have these these brochures just going through what karting was. And and again, I was a kid at the time, and they had a couple of carts on display at the Melbourne show and these brochures, and I grabbed one of those, and I thought, oh, yeah, this looks looks like fun. But there was no go-kart club at that point. And then the uh, the ad come up in the newspaper, and, um, yeah, away we went. All uh, right. So then you, so you got your cart, and I've worked out that it's a bit of a danger. Yep. So yep. what did you end yeah, up buying so something a little I'd more been racing? Mumming lawns to earn some money, and oh, I and right. I sold. I ended up it was a big move to sell the paddock cart because I grew up on a farm, and we'd go out and oh, on a dewy morning and do donuts on the wet grass and all that sort of stuff. Usual kid stuff. Yeah, and uh, so uh, to to fund a race cart, I had to sell that. So that was a, that was a big move. Yeah, and, uh, and went and bought a second hand cart. It was an old Zip chassis, uh-huh. big uh huh, which. With a, a brand new Yamaha J engine. Oh, okay. And they'd already and out by racing then. in juniors in that. Yeah. Is- yeah. The J engines were just coming out as being the thing to have, and the national classes were just sort of kicking off at that point. It, and it did propagate pretty quickly, I think, the J from memory. It did. Yeah. Yeah. Both the J and the S, the Yamaha classes really um, expanded quickly because it was a relatively cheap engine and far more reliable yeah. than the other race engines that were around at the time. Yeah, the yeah, reliability was a killer. really boomed karting at that point. Yeah, because I remember growing up as a kid, um, and <clears throat> just to give you the listeners some context, Mark and I actually were at the same kart club. Mark was a uh, you used to race down at Oakley as well, and yep. he was uh, maybe I don't know three or four years older, something like this. So I remember seeing Mark as an as a as a junior kid coming up. And he was out there racing Club and Light or whatever it was at the time, which is the Yamaha S. And I had the yep. little junior cart. So yeah, um, the the Jays propagated quickly, and then you know, like all the classes were were massive. And I think back now is that uh, yeah, there was more expensive classes to run, like the internationals, reed valves, and all this and that. The sticky tires, you know, everyone wanted to do it, but you know, it just didn't seem like that many people had the cash for that sort of thing back in the day as a kid growing up. Yeah, that's right. I think people were a bit more, um, maybe a bit more conservative where they'd spend their their spare dollars. Uh-huh. And if you're going into something like the read classes at the time, it was more expensive and and you always see engines seizing and yeah. and that sort of stuff. And it, it was a fairly expensive thing to do. Whereas the, the I, I guess the, the higher performance classes these days, still big dollars to do it, but the equipment, the material that they're using is so much more reliable. Correct. Yeah, the chances then. of finishing are way higher. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You get your ten hours of use easy, almost like the old air cooled Clubman lifespan, but with the performance of the water cooled reed valve engine. Yeah, and the one two five. Um. Yeah. So then, so right. So you got your J engine. You started doing some racing. Um. Talk us through like your racing career, start to finish. Like, uh, did you have oh, some highlights wow. that you want to <laughs> touch on or memories yeah, that you want to yeah, share um, with the people? I started off in the in the juniors in karting and um, and then went to seniors with a Yamaha S engine, so into the club and light. Um, and I used to be really skinny, so I had to put a lot of lead on to just yeah. to get into the into the lightweight class. And we're talking here, the class weight was was one hundred and twenty kilos. 120, yeah, one hundred and twenty five kilos, I think. For light, yeah, yeah, for light, yep. And and I had to put like five kilos of lead on <laughs> to, yeah, to reach right. the minimum. So, I mean, I was light, but also the carts were so much light, lighter and far more nimble to drive compared to the the modern carts as well. I think they were probably a bit more fun. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, just, as in the, it was something that was just strapped onto you, not strapped onto you, but it was in addition to you rather than you being in addition, in addition to it. Yes. <laughs> okay. Deal. Um, so, yeah, we... We initially started racing at the old Morwell Hill Climb circuit, which doesn't exist anymore. It's been cut up. It's now a big hole for coal mining for the power industry. Awesome. So the circuit's gone, but it was like a mini Bathurst. It was a really great track, massively dangerous. If you, if you come <laughs> off, you'd hit a tree. All right. And, and and they shut us down, actually. The, the VKA said, uh, no, I don't think you should be running go-karts around this place, which was fair enough, but it was a good track. 
And uh, so the club I was with uh, didn't have a circuit at that time. And I believe at the time the, the state rules or whatever said that you could only be a member of one club. And so we went, my brother and myself went and joined the Oakley Club and raced down there for a number of years, which is probably the time. This would be the the late 80s, uh-huh. thereabouts. Yep, there you go. Um, and did a number of years at Oakley, which from from a, a competition point of view was great because it's a was a one of the biggest clubs at the time, uh-huh. really strong competition, and uh, the circuit itself is difficult. So it was good to do a couple of years of racing there because it really sharpened you up. It's a... It's a top club and um and circuit yeah for the for the guys listening oakley is situated in southeastern suburbs of melbourne and it was a bit of a melting pot because everyone used to come from say uh, in the gippsland area on the mornington peninsula um, yep. from the city and even from the western suburbs and they'd come across to oakley every month because the fields were so big and all yeah. the classes were represented almost like state level racing at a club day because absolutely you yeah, know, the fields were ridiculously big there compared to everywhere else. Um, yeah, so it was it was it was good to compete at that because you you just learn so much. Yeah, almost like uh, what the Ipswich Cart Club is to Southeast Queensland currently. Yeah, um, absolutely. You get the, do a club day at Ipswich at the moment, and uh, you might as well be doing a state championship. There was it's, nearly four hundred people there on the weekend. But yeah. <laughs> it was a shakedown for the AKC, but the high two hundreds is not uncommon in fields of 20, 25 people. We, and in a hard competition too, like a lot of the big big hitters are there every month, getting their reps in and just enjoying, you know, good quality hard racing. And yeah, that's one thing that's never faded. If you get a big field and you know, guys are really going for it and they then in their mega competitive races. Everyone else lifts too because they're seeing exactly. those that competition every every week, every month, top thing, and everyone's out there trying to get better. And I think that's why Southeast Queensland is so. Yeah, you know, we do have a lot of great drivers um, because there's a lot of great drivers. Sort of creates more great drivers. It pushes the competition. That's right. More. Yep. Yeah, sweet. So then, um, so you you're racing in the 80s and 90s. Oh, I yep. haven't had much or haven't seen you out on the track probably since i only know you through your um business uh cart sport news um what have you been doing since say the 90s did you end up hanging up the boots or did you keep racing um well no i always wanted to go car racing and and uh karting was what was available to me at the time as far as it was accessible yeah and then in the budget wise yeah and then in um 90 I had saved up enough money and and borrowed a bit from the bank of mum and dad as well, (laughs) which is fortunate, Um, and uh, bought a Formula V and went went open wheeler racing. I couldn't afford Formula Ford. I had some friends that were were doing that and uh, would have liked to have done it, but um, I didn't have, one, the money, or secondly, and just as importantly, I didn't have the technical know-how sure. to, to to maintain and run a Formula Ford, whereas Formula V is pretty basic. It's not not really any, dip, not much different to a cart. Uh-huh. And um, and I didn't have the money to pay someone to, you know, like, yeah. like everything these days, you go to a team and all of the expertise is there. Yeah, the rival uh, that didn't. Stuff. Yeah, it didn't sort of... Uh, um, there wasn't much of that happening at the time. So yeah, did did Formula V for a year and a half. Uh got third at the Nationals over at the Barbagello uh, circuit in Western Australia. Went all um, the way to Western Australia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and again, big race meeting cost me hardly anything. Why? Uh, the promoters of Formula V in Victoria had uh, there was a guy on the committee, I think it was, who worked for shopping centers and they arranged to get some Victorian cars over. They went by train, I believe. And the deal was they had to go over a week or two prior and they were on display in some shopping centers in Perth. And uh, so basically just cost me an airfare and an entry fee and race the nationals in Perth. I was going to say, because like driving. Yeah, was, there's no way K. I'd be. <laughs> 4, I couldn't K. drive over to the, the time off work and everything to, to drive over would not be a realistic thing to do. But yeah, it was great. Good circuit, actually. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks very basic on a piece of paper, but with up the undulations and the the bottom turn down the back, it's actually really um, difficult to get a fast lap time there. Yeah, it was, it was good. Easy. Is that the same one the V eight guys go to now, where they come yeah. up over that hill? 
Yeah, and we we raced on the full circuit. There is a sort of a cut through where you can oh, just okay. race on the on the hill that faces the the crowd. But we uh-huh. used the full circuit, went over the, the the top out of view, and come back again. Yeah, yeah, good track. All right. So how how many years? Um, so did Rock and Formula Ford did oh. about a year and a half of Formula V. Yeah, and then I uh, right um was some club and we were friends at the at the time as as far as going racing together etc in carts he moved into formula ford and i went into formula v and then um i ended up leasing he he i don't know how much you know of formula ford but he ended up as being the valvoline sponsored driver in 95 it would be who was that and Sorry. so his car jason bright oh jason bright yeah he was very good yep. yeah yeah, and uh, and so he, he the car he used to use he was leasing out, so I leased that, and did a round of the national series at Phillip Island. Um, so I did I did a race in Formula Ford, but it it absolutely teamed down with rain, and I was going okay in the race. I think I was running third or something. I was running third at the time, and um, aquaplaned off hit the fence, oh, tore the side out of the car. Yeah, but you're going for it though. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> was, yeah well that's right. It was a. <laughs> well, the funny thing was. I, I thought prior at the time with Formula Ford, if you ran a national meeting and I think if you finished in the top five or something, you were not allowed to run state level anymore. Oh, and that's a shame. I didn't have the budget to do national, but I I did have the I had some money to go and do the state rounds, and so I had if I I had in the back of my head I thought, geez, if I end up going okay, do I keep going and get the placing? Or do I back off at the line and wait for others to go through so I don't destroy my chance of racing for the rest of the, so rest of the year? Back in yeah. your life, you just destroyed the car. So that, and that's budget. basically what happened. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't get I didn't get to the point where I had to make the decision because I tore all the wheels off in the fence. The decision was made for yeah. you. Uh, yeah. The gods so, dumped the rain on the track. <laughs> so that was the end of the open wheel career. I bet. And the race <laughs> so I had to sell the Formula V to pay for the damage and all that sort of stuff. So How much was the damage uh, bill? Ah. Uh, it probably it would have been about ten grand probably at the time. Oh, geez. that's like probably mid-90s. a lot. For it it was took small. like it took two corners off. It broke the bell housing. We had to strip the frame down because the push rod come through and hit the hit one of the bars in the chassis and bent that as well. It was a. I mean, it was all repaired back. It was a. It was a good car again at the end. There was nothing wrong with I, it, but there was I, a yeah, lot yeah, of things. Nice. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah. sign me up. <laughs> I'll buy that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Trust me. I only drink yeah. it on Sundays. Yeah, yeah. lady driver. <laughs> so, um, so I was out of out of racing then. I, I was, um, I got back into go karting uh, a little bit in '96, '97. Some friends, uh, you might have heard, Graham and Jeanette Mons, they helped me out with um, uh, some racing there for a while. Graham used to be. Uh, he did Clark, of course, for Pro Tour for a number of years uh, when IKD were doing the Pro Tour. So he yeah. was involved quite a bit with that um, and and helped me a lot with with racing, uh, with the Formula Ford and, and karting after that. And then uh, I got introduced to a guy called Graham Jones, Butch Jones, probably no relation to you. No, no relation. No. But anyway, well, maybe. Uh, anyway, he, he but... had a car, a HQ, um, that he entered at the Calder Park Thunderdome. Hey. And he wanted another driver for that. And a friend of mine knew that I had raced cars and said, oh, I know someone who's looking for a driver. So we went and met up and uh, and raced Thunderdome for a few years as well. He, and, he, and, and what that, sort of car? That joint is wild. It was. crazy. You know, people think of, of, of asphalt speedway racing, you know, you just turn and go through. The thing is... Nothing. Well, it's it's nothing like anything else. You walk out of Calder Park at the end of a Thunderdome meeting, you think, survived another one. Dodge a bullet. <laughs> what sort of car yeah. were you driving there? Uh, HQs. Oh, HQs. Oh, it's, sorry, it's what, still there? the car? Yeah, the HQ. Yeah, yeah. yeah there was HQ Holdens, the, the whole field, HQs, like 30, 40 cars in the field. Three on the tree? Uh, all the same. Uh, the one I was using was three on the tree, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Man. Uh, most of them had the shifter on the on the floor, oh. but uh, yeah, no. Butcher's car had had three on the tree, which was okay because it's on the Thunderdome. You know, you're starting in second gear. And it goes green, just bang it down into third and hold it there. Hold it flat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Steel radials yeah. on the well, tires. Uh, it was a Goodyear road tire, buffed. Uh-huh. Um, so I don't know what the specs of the tire were, other than it was black and round. Yeah. <laughs> Hazy, um, hazy details. But the thing the, with the Thunderdome, if you were running by yourself, you could get around there flat on a on a good day. 
uh, but turns three and four in particular had quite a few bumps. And so when, because you're always running in a pack, so sure. you're in a draft and and you, um, you'd you have to sort of feather the throttle a little bit uh, because of the cars in front, you can't hit him in the turn, you'd end up causing a sure. big wreck. So that and, was like, uh, because you're in the really slipstream, unstable. You, had to, you had to lift a little bit because you had that extra power from the slipstream or made the cars Typically, unstable? Yeah, a, a bit of both. Um, if you if you held flat, sometimes your thing would get so far out of shape, you'd scrub more speed than if you just lifted it a little. Not saying come right off, yeah, but yeah, just break yeah. the full throttle a bit to reduce the amount of, and then once it's gone into the turn, settle it, you're back on it again. No way! Uh, yeah, it's, it's incredible. And, and and you can, it's weird to say it, but you can sort of, you can feel when there's another car coming up to you because you'd start getting pushed around because of the air. Sure. Are, are we, it starts uh, to lift the rear or something. Yeah. It just it must be the, the pressure around the other car coming up on you and you sort of move around. And and the other thing, which, and this was a real mind screw initially when I was first driving the thing, you'd hit a bump and the car would not just bump, but it would twist on the track as well. And that was because you're running all different offset weights in the, in the springs to make and, and different cambers at the front so we had a camber split so that when you get to the corner you just basically relax your relax your grip and the thing would sort of turn down into the turn but you'd have to hold it straight ah uh, then you'd straighten it up yourself yeah, <laughs> yeah okay so, so when it whenever you hit a bump it was not just a normal vertical up and down the thing would twist as well and i'm thinking oh man this is just crazy <laughs> yeah right well i'll, I'll have to get a get picture used to it. I have to get a picture of a uh, HQ Holden for the American fans, so they can, and I'll put it into the <laughs> the video format, so they can see what these old yeah yeah. Old, it's basically I'd love to dig up a couple of photos here for you to, th- yeah, just to yeah. slip in. Yeah. Well, what is it? A nineteen sixties, late sixties, early. 70s? Uh, they were no seventies. Uh, I think they ran from seventy one to seventy three. Yeah. Some Holden Holden tech head's probably going to nail yeah. me on what that, but heck, it's, it's around that period anyway. Yeah, yeah. And they built hundreds of thousands of them yeah it's like a gm wasn't it it was a gm, GM car with a yeah yeah whatever six, seven, one eight six two oh two in it yeah. Yeah, 202. yeah 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 big ball baby <laughs> but <laughs> runny and the thunder dome for the guys that don't, don't know. know was a racetrack in victoria at calder park you can google it and it was basically an american style speedway bitumen banked corners high bank fun. yeah yeah i don't even and it know. was the only place they ran uh, at the time, anyway, uh, the only place that NASCAR raced outside of America. Yeah, right. It was officially sanctioned by NASCAR for a number of years. Yeah, yeah and what, the Yanks used to come over and have a spin, did Yeah, they? yeah, that, the Americans would come out and do a like a big Christmas meeting. Uh-huh. I mean, not, not the whole NASCAR field, but just a couple. half a dozen Americans come out to um, basically whip the Australians. Yeah, I was going to say spank NASCAR. everybody. <laughs> yeah, and then sell their cars here. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, because we had the Oz car running. That was just like a... Um, like a fancy, uh, like a dumbed down version of a NASCAR, wasn't it? Sort of, yeah. It was made of um, hot, uh, Commodores and Falcons, uh, barred out to a, a bit like a NASCAR, but it was still based on a stock chassis, whereas uh-huh. the NASCAR is fully fabricated. Yeah, and right. I think the engines were smaller. They ran on road tires, but was uh, sort of like a a a, a, a budget relatively budget level compared to a NASCAR and a bit slower. But, but Oscar was very very popular. Yeah. yeah, okay. And what happened to Calder Park? Do you know? Uh, it's still there. Um, the Thunderdome? The Thunderdome, yeah. Yeah, it's still there. It's really sad when you drive past the place because of all the memories you have there. And it's sure. there's some YouTube videos where people have uh, basically broken into the Thunderdome with a video camera and gone yeah. through. And it's like, you know, those uh, deserted shopping centres in America. Oh, do they get out there and drive on it, or they just no, they don't. No, they no, they don't drive on it. But up in the grandstands and the control tower is all dilapidated now and run down. It's uh, it's really sad. But they're bringing, um, they're refurbishing part of the flat track now. So uh-huh. I think there's going to be some club level racing there. The the Thunderdome still gets used for promotional purposes. I think they do drifting there. They film ads there and that sort of stuff. But there's no oh, so there's no racing happening there anymore. So yeah, inside the. The Thunderdome itself, the the circuit's still laid down and everything. Yeah, circuit's still there. The cir- and it, it's it's rough, but the yeah. circuit's there. Um, uh, they they keep the infield and everything mowed down from what I from what I believe. So because they they do use the venue for various purposes, yeah, but sure. there, there hasn't been serious racing on the Thunderdome part of it anyway for many years. 
Yeah, because the, the the flat circuit, I remember. I think they used to race the touring cars there in the late eighties, or early nineties. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. They used to run uh, the flat circuit. Used to be before my time. That was a, a place to go. Apparently, for Melbourne people, they'd go out to the race car races on a Sunday out at Calder Park every couple of weeks. Yeah, right. Um, I, I remember going there as a kid to watch the cars. Yeah, my mum and dad yeah. took me out there. And uh, yeah, it was uh, about as miles away, man. We lived out on the peninsula, so. It, Freaking uh, the other side of yeah. the city, Calder Park. As a kid, you're like, "What the right. heck?" <laughs> also, yeah, stay the night. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, so that takes you right up to like, uh, you you racing around there. Did you do any other racing other than that, or um? Uh, we did race? Thunderdome. Um, I, I did a bit of well, well, I'll call it super karting. Was running with the super karts, but with the Rotax. Uh-huh. Yeah, right. Um, a guy, uh, John Crook, and his son Dean, they have, oh, they had um, the hyper stimulator. You know the the simulators, the uh, for computer gaming. Yeah, driving? yeah, sure. Yep, they used to make the the hyper stimulator was their brand, and they had a race hyper center simulator. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure this is a car racing yeah, game? Yeah. <laughs> it was fun, but it wasn't that much fun. <laughs> <laughs> um. They they were building and distributing these uh, cockpits that people would then um, you know hook up to their PCs to do racing games. Like this is sure. before I racing come along. Okay, uh, racing NASCAR games and various things, and they had race centers where people would come in and do a race night as a social sort of thing. Yeah. Anyway, they got involved in karting and built up um, a cart a super a, a super cart sort of based on a sprint chassis to some extent with the Rotax, but put their own bodywork on it and had the seat laying back and get it out of the wind and everything. And and they said, well, okay, um, uh, let's go let's go racing. So I ended up driving for them for a year, year, year or two, yeah, two sure. years, doing um, like Winton, the supercut or? circuits. Yeah, uh, I drove it at Winton, didn't race the Hyper at, um, at Winton. I've raced... V's and uh, driven the Formula Ford at Winton, race HQs at Winton, but not the not the cart, but raced it at um, mostly Phillip Island. Um, where else do we race it? Uh, Calder on the road circuit, uh, Goulburn. Goulburn. At, um, oh, is Goulburn, that the- uh, Wakefield Park. Wakefield, yeah, Wakefield yeah, Park. Raced it at Wakefield. Oh, and Oran Park too. Yeah, raced boy. Oran Park before it shut down. Yeah. yeah. Raced sprint carts at Oran Park as well, down the yeah, bottom over of the, the track. Bridge. Yeah. yeah, over the bridge. Oh, mate. Coming off the bridge, the rest of the track was just a big U-turn to do that again. Oh, uh, really? Why? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I loved so Oran good. Park. Yeah, I, I raced up there a couple of times. Um, but it, yeah, that was a that was a brilliant circuit. The, the I, I never track. drove on it. Um, as you went up over the bridge, was the bridge really wide? Because that's where the cars used to go, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. The bridge was relatively wide. Yeah, the as far as the width of the asphalt, but there was sure. no runoff. No, nah. because where the asphalt finished, there was the the yeah. guardrails destroyed sure. going over the edge. He never takes a holiday. <laughs> yeah. So it was um. The, the race line was not near the necessarily up against the guardrail. Sure. And you weren't facing the guardrail as in you're not going to come in. No, nah, it's uh, basically uh, a like straight. You're running, you're it? running at the same, same uh, direction as it. But yeah, when you come over the bridge, the, the track falls away and you had yes. to do a hard right hand corner to yeah. get down the little zigzag down to the bottom level. Yeah. And uh, the- yeah, that was a, that was a great bit of track coming off there. Yeah. Everyone has some pretty good memories of Iron Park. And there's some they I think they had the um that big sort of CIK event there too I've seen on YouTube and uh, yeah they had the the uh, what was Richard? it called Castrol Cart Prix I think they called Cart it Prix. and they had some of the internationals uh, Zanardi Magnuson uh, they I remember one of the That's right, Jan I, was, yeah Jan Magnuson dad, yeah Kevin it? Magnuson's dad isn't it yeah yeah I'm pretty sure he was a kid. <laughs> was I he? was up there racing. Yeah, I was racing club and light, and he would have been racing in juniors. Jan Magnuson. Yeah. Yeah, right. Wow. There you go. Throwing it back. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the late 80s and well, mostly the 90s when sprint karting was really, um, really hitting hard. And they had the International Formula A, um, International, Intercontinental A. Yep. It was some wicked race, like the it sticky was. tires and. The guys still fizz on that stuff. They love it. Yeah. Well, the, the the carts. I mean, the engines didn't have starters with on them. They, for a lot of that time, they didn't have to have. There was no 
uh, radiators on them. They didn't huh. have batteries on them. Most of them probably didn't have data loggers on them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Digitronics. So <laughs> yeah, and I think the tires were very different then as well compared okay. to the 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 material that is in the tires these days. Because I remember back in the day um, on a on a sticky track, you turn the corner and. The, <laughs> you'd go around on two wheels or whatever and yeah. you don't really see that outside of carts jacking too heavily sort of deal you don't really see quite as much of people out of control two wheeling and, and I never forget uh going back to Will Yarwood um yeah. he was racing I think it was Formula A in the late 90s when I worked for the Cardoz magazine or at sure. Eastern Creek and you're familiar with Eastern Creek where they come down the hill and there's the right hand corner around the pits at all I've, oh, they've just seen it on YouTube yeah yeah. Anyway, Will's come down there and he's basically just gently turning the cart in, nearly tipped the thing over, went up on two wheels. Grip roller. Yeah, and yeah. He is a big yeah. unit, isn't he, though? But they big, really big shoulders and he sits quite high in the cart. So you can. That's right. Of... Yeah. Well, he, he had a high, no matter how far he puts the seat down, he's got a high center of gravity. Yeah. And this thing he was driving just must have had mega grip to the point where it was. Um, it was not drivable. Yeah. 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 Big really are. Uh, he's, I think he's still got one and he's given me a spin in it. It's like an old CRG. I wonder if that was the same car. Um, back nah, in- this one, it was a BRM, I think. A BRM. The one, the one that I saw him two wheeled. Yeah. He used to do a lot of racing with CRG, had a lot of success with that. Yeah. The one, I, I, I think I might, he'll correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, <laughs> I I'll have to get him on. He, he couldn't keep it on four two. wheels. Huh? I'll call Big Willie, shout out. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Power Public Podcast. He's a good <laughs> dude. Good see, stories. He's actually at the go kart tracks all around here. He's only up in Brisbane, maybe one hour from from the house of Power. So it's uh, I see Big Willie all the time. Yeah, he's a great dude, and he's got a yeah. wealth of a kart knowledge. Yeah, yeah. So, what karting circuits have you enjoyed the most? Um, there was Oran Park coming off the bridge, like we were talking about. Yeah. Um, the Newcastle track I really enjoyed because it, it's difficult. Uh, it's got undulations yeah. over the, 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 the there's blind corners on there. Um, I really enjoyed there, but I, I a bit different to a lot of people. I think I like little odd shitty racetracks. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. And I don't want to be critical of how Bendigo circuit was because I enjoyed the Bendigo track was um, up and down. It still is up and down okay. through the trees. Okay. But the main straight wasn't straight, had a curve in it. For the nice. starting, um, it the edges of the track were crumbled. There was not a constant radius corner on the track. It had camber, off camber, on camber. It was just a mix. It was like a the greater driver was drunk and just drove around and come back. Okay, but I, it was I, one of my favourite tracks to drive on. And this is this is how it was twenty or thirty years ago, and it's been changed. And from what I hear, it's it's now a nicer track to drive on because they've straightened up the main straight, so they've got the you know, the starting lines that they have uh, now yeah. to line the carts up, all that sort of stuff. Fantastic. And it's just, yeah, it, it um, doesn't quite, to me anyway, have quite the character of the older style rough and tumble bush tracks, yeah. <laughs> if you like. Yeah, because like you get used to the, yeah. those bumps. You get, yeah, and you can use them to your advantage when you know where to use them or avoid them or whatever the case is. And then you see, uh, particularly with new tracks or even clubs that, get funding to extend the track and all they're doing is adding distance and it's a straight with a constant radius corner at one end and it brings it back and you think what was the the point of doing that you've added length but it's it's boring you know all the curbs are the same because they have to meet a standard and and it's got uh, and again i understand some of the reasoning for it but it's just not as much fun to drive compared to a track that's just random and all over the place have you been to the new Oakley track? It's in its fourth or fifth rendition now. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've been down there. I haven't driven on it, uh-huh. um, but from what I hear, it's it's a lot of fun and uh, it's got a like, a like a corkscrew thing coming down the hill and I've taken photographs there and get some quite spectacular photos as the carts crest the hill. So I haven't driven it. I've heard hill do they it's go? really easy to overdrive coming down the hill. Okay. Because uh, the thing, you know, it steps out and because the track's falling away, you take so long to get it back again. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't so, been there since the 90s. So uh, it would be fun to go back there and have a fang. I have to get in contact with uh, Greggy down there and um, come down for a fang, but not until the spring. Because I remember being a kid <laughs> driving around that track in the freezing fog 
of winter in in Melbourne with my hands just freezing to death. Like, what the heck was my dad thinking? Yeah, yeah. And back in those days, the place used to stink as well. Being on an old tip, you'd often yeah. get. Dad. It doesn't stink anymore. No, not from what I can recall. I can't really recall much of a smell there at all. Actually, all oh, right, the tips are uh, not now. There. Whether that's just been it was good days or not, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> no, it doesn't really have that issue as what as what it did back in the back in the day. Because yeah, the circuit is built on an old tip, and it's interesting what you say about Greg Smith down there, the Baron. Yeah, and, the Baron. Um, him and his dad were very heavily involved, especially his dad years ago. And I always wondered why, because with Oakley, you you go to Oakley one year and drive around on the track and it's got all its undulations and everything. You come back two years later and what was a bump is turned into a ski jump <laughs> because the, it was always it was always moving. It was always different. And it, it still is to some extent. But he was saying that when the tr- circuit was built on the tip, the tip used to they dig holes and put all the rubbish in, but the ho- it was not one big pit it was a like a trench and then they'd have another one and then oh. another one and oh, so no. the circuits laid over the top and so it sunk where the rubbish was then it goes up where the earth bank was then it dips down that's why it's got all this up and down in it i you told me that oh, a year or two ago i never knew that it was an interesting oh, okay. reasoning why it's always moving yeah yeah well i mean uh, i think um I, I remember the track to be almost well i mean i don't remember all the bumps but, you know, and like a ski jump, I know there was one corner like it just definitely st- started dropping away. Like you, just before you used to near the Yarra Terra area there at the at the top of the track. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. Like as a kid, I, it never really seemed to bother me. You know, like like you said, it adds to the character. Yeah, yeah, adds to the character. Um, but it depends on what year. I can't remember the years. The Oakley has had so many. Um, resurfaces and changes where they've flattened out some of the bumps shaped them down and and so on so um i've seen carts come out uh what i don't know what it's called now the old the dpe sweeper the flat corner well it's not flat it's banked but um it used to sink and then you come out of that and the carts would basically get airborne and wheel spin as they exited and uh when it got you know when it sagged the track had sagged but they, they they keep fixing it up and um the amount of movement now, I believe, is much less than what it was. Yeah, I guess it's been thirty odd more years. That, the that, that's right. Pretty much settled. So, yeah. Well, yeah, I, the other track, the you know, how you said you went to Newcastle. I went there last year for the first time and did, uh, did maybe ten or fifteen laps, and my neck. Oh, good god, damn it! Like that. There's some a couple of really high G corners there as you're coming back up the track. The ski jump and that. Yeah was a little vague because I didn't know which way the track went. But when you go down through the bottom of the circuit, as you start coming up, the tyres being so grippy, like you could nearly, it was like a no brakes. You just came in there flat, like it's nearly full noise, the like hundred odd Ks or whatever. You just lift yeah. off, turn, and the car just goes, <laughs> like it's bottoming out. <laughs> There's that much load going through. Yeah, yeah. Through the yeah you go up down the back straight and down through the blind S's and you, there's the compression as you go into that corner to head back up the hill. It's just, yeah, it's great. Yeah. Far better than a flat track. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought it was excellent. I could only imagine having a race meeting now. I've never done one. Um, Because you, you, the potential for error is, is pretty high there. Cause yeah, the- yeah, that's no, a, it's a, it's a top circuit. Yeah. yeah, and I've also I've I've never I'd I'd never got to the circuit, and I don't believe they use it for racing anymore. There's a the circuit at Rally. Yes, a lot of people say that that is is brilliant, or yes. was brilliant at the time. There's there's clips on YouTube of it, um, but yeah, everyone that I've known who's been there said that was probably one of the best circuits that we ever had in Australia. I did go there for the Pro Tour, and it would have been around 2009, 10 when Pro Tour first started. And I remember I was only just there as a spectator. I drove down for the day. It's about three or four hours drive south of here. So I drove down and I got there. I was sort of new to karting up here in Queensland. And I hadn't seen the Rotax drive that much because it was relatively new to me. I'd use the Clubmans and, and this sort of stuff. And so anyway, so I go down there and I'm checking out this pro tour and I was like, oh, hey, this is pretty cool. And Dave Serra was there and he absolutely murdered the competition, like the whole field by, I want to say the length of the straight, if not more. And this is the first time I'd ever seen 
you know, everyone was talking about this roll time, you know, rolling through the corner and picking up the throttle way later with this modern one, two, five engine. Anyway, the, you go um, over the start line up through like a little a bit of a bus stop and you go up a little hill and there's a, like a 180 degree corner. And I walked out there to just to watch and I was watching the road tax light and Dave Sarah was out in front doing his thing as he always does or regularly do, do, did back then. And he'd come into the corner, lock up the brakes, like a, just a tiny little like threshold break. And then you'd hear nothing. And you'd turn the corner and you'd get to the apex. And then and I couldn't believe it. There was no noise. <laughs> and he goes all the way out to the exit ripple strip. And he'd, he'd pick up the throttle. And I was, I was in awe of this guy. He was absolutely murdering everybody. And he was on the throttle over near the, it sounded like the exit ripple strip. It was probably a little bit earlier. And um, it really opened my mind to like, wow, this rolling through the corners and waiting to get on the throttle is um, you know, good enough for him and he's destroying everybody. Um, it's good enough for me. And I think after that, I started practicing that technique yeah. rather than, you know, like, you know, like. Yeah. And, and isn't it running. a difficult technique to get in your head? Because you, you, you roll into the corner, all you want to do is, you know, we're racing. You want to go, you want to go, you want to go. And you, you're so tempted to get on the throttle. Yeah. And, it's just it's, yeah, he, and he's the under, undisputed king of those things. Like, well, I watch him, and he, he well, I think he won like four or five national titles in a row in the road tax light hard category. Yeah. It took it's pretty impressive. It was, and it took, um, and I was like big in road tax racing then as a um, as a mechanic and and watching and stuff. And it took um, Pierce Lahane every ounce of power that he could muster to beat him down at Dubbo to knock him off that pedestal. Because you know how we were talking <laughs> earlier, the guys that are winning, they don't forget. They've got the formula. They That's know right. how to put they a weekend together. together. And you got to knock him off. And Pierce was an amazing competitor as a junior. I loved watching him. He was a, a killer racer, super, super fast, super aggressive, and mega consistent. And he could, you know, charge through the pack, do everything. And it was someone that great that it took and a lot of practice. And he was throwing tires at it every you know, every session, he was the first person I ever saw do that too. He was new ties, new ties, new ties, new ties in practice. So that he in qualified papers, yeah, position. Yeah. <laughs> so that then he hit the first race and he had new tie technique all down pat. And, yeah. you know, he had a great race weekend that 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 time and he, and he ended up winning it. And I think that was the first time that he, that Dave hadn't won it in a couple of years. And, um, but yeah, great competitors and yeah, that roll time thing, man, blew my yeah. mind when I saw it. And with the Rotax in particular, even the the throttle application is as far you know you don't get go bang on the throttle. You just you got to feed it in, and that was a big thing when I raced the Rotax on the big circuits with supercars um, at Phillip Island, as an example. You come over the hill at Lukey Heights into yes. the tight hairpin at the bottom of the hill. Yeah. Now, when you get there and you get to the apex, you, you could get on the gas and you could give it full gas and just hold it flat all the way around to basically turn two, turn okay. one's flat. Okay. Sure. The thing is though. Um, it, what, uh, finding it wasn't the best way of doing it. You go into the brake, turn the corner, and then you get on the gas. And I, w I used to be on maybe half throttle to three-quarter throttle from the hairpin up through the left-hander, and I wouldn't hit full throttle until I got out of the, the kink onto the little straight bit before the last turn. Now, I could have gone full throttle, but and I don't know the technicalities of it, um, but uh, Peter Woodgate, who was doing my engine at the time, was saying, you know, you, the carburetor is too big for the engine. If you open it too early at low revs, it's not going to do anything. You know, you're, you're just wasting it, and um, it's not an efficient way of, of accelerating the engine. So it was using part throttle for quite a while before the revs got up, then gave it full throttle. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think you, the, the marriage... Of your throttle application for that engine to the corner that you're on like for the torque delivery plus for the airspeed that you've got going through it it, it was one of the subtle details and i think that's what made rotax racing and it still does so so much fun it's so awesome it because you've got probably what you'd call an oversized carburetor on a go-kart uh, uh the 34 millimeter delorto we're talking about here um and with a slide carby it just lets so much air into the engine and if it doesn't need that much air, well, it hasn't got the signal to get the fuel out of the bowl, so you end up with a lean condition and your power sucks, or it can, mm -hmm. compared to your competitors that might have optimised their carburation at that same load point on the same part of the circuit. And 
that to me is what is appealing about the, the Rotax engine and Rotax racing, yeah. Yeah, it's a diff- different de- technique for sure. Mm, mm. And yeah, I'd, I'd say Dave Serra is probably the probably one of the best, if not the best, that I've seen. Yep. In, in that. And what amazes me with Dave, he had massive success and everything. Yeah. But especially in the earlier part of his career, I guess he still does it now when he has the occasional drive. But he he used to really, um, from an outside perspective, he used to really attack the corners, and the cart would be working its tires really hard, and yet. He didn't tear them up. Yeah, right. Yeah, and like uh, when they're running on on soft tire, when he was racing even KZ two to some extent, I always thought, oh, geez, Dave's pushing pretty hard here in the heats. He's not going to have any rubber left, but he seemed you know, seemed to be fine. Maybe because so he's it's just it appears that he's sliding it on the it wing. Is, like, yeah, but maybe it's and, and it's not, but it's when uh, it's under yeah. Yeah, he, when he's on under load, do I have to ask him? Maybe he can be another guest. Yeah, yeah, I will. Yep. Or, or join up one of his cart classes. He's, he's kicking some goals with what he's doing there at the moment too. Yeah, so. yeah, no, he's very good. Very good. I, I've seen, yeah, I see a lot of it on TikTok and stuff like that. It comes up and, uh, yeah, he's obviously, he's pretty handy at, at, at his coaching and stuff like that, I think. Yep. So is there anything else that you wanted to share with the guys that you love about um, cart racing? Um. Oh, I mean, it's still still a great sport. Still enjoy yeah. it. The being the the competition side of it and the the physicalities of the driving it and everything like that. Um, I, I've always enjoyed the the in the past more so the simplicity of it in that um, not not necessarily easier, but there was less involved to just get involved in the sport. Whereas now, just you got to register just to go and do a practice day. But the, the actual on track stuff I still enjoy, and uh, and looking back, uh, and you only get this perspective, I guess, with time. Is you you look back and you think, oh yeah, that was actually a lot of fun. Where we used to, I used to have a my first car was a Ford Econa van because you ah. put go karts in it. You see, sure, sure. and uh, we'd lived in the country, and myself, my brother Jason, and another mate Alistair, would put a um, couple of carts in the trailer, a couple of carts in the back of the Econa van with the, like the trestle horse. Put a yeah. cart in, trestle horse on top. Tie the other card on, right? Fill it up with people, spare engines, petrol, and everything, and we'd head off to the city, go racing for the weekend. Yeah, yeah, kids, and uh, and that was just looking back. It was they were great times doing that for a few years. I think that um, you've hit the nail on the head. That's one of the best things about the karting is when you stop karting and you look back at the time that you did have. At the time, you maybe yeah. didn't realise it, but it was just fat, and you've got those wicked memories. Whether it was with your dad or your mates, as a bit of an older yeah. guy. Um, yeah, you think back, and even sometimes I think back, and dude, you can you can just remember the exact event and what went down, and you talk to you. Oh, I remember in the final on lap three, yeah, he lost a chain. <laughs> it's funny how little things get yeah. triggered, and yeah, yeah. And I guess that's and, probably... and now I have trouble remembering what I did yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Paperwork. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, but that was yeah. Think thinking back, I, I, we. Well, I only got into into the karting just to go racing. I wasn't in it for any social reason at all. But okay. you look back later and you think, oh, yeah, it was actually a good time. And the other thing was, and and um, you start racing with the innocence of the commercial realities of going kart racing. You know, you, everyone goes in and thinks they're going to be the next oh, big sure. thing. And, uh, and, and you sort of blink into that. And so just having that, um, the innocence of not knowing that things don't happen was good because you didn't know what you don't know what you don't know. So um you just keep being training up, up every week, trying your best, trying to get better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thinking that someone's going to be looking and oh someone might think they put you in their car or something like that. And sure. very rarely does that any ever happen. But um when there's hope, um it it's good good times. It is true. Like you really got to be self funded and do everything yourself. Um occasionally you do get picked up by very generous people, but it's relationships. So if you're not out there actively building relationships, you can be the best go-kart driver on the planet. That's the, that's the big thing these days. And and that's something that I didn't realize at the time. And even today, I'm not the most social type of person as far as doing social events and mixing with people and all that sort of stuff. But if, if I was to give advice to someone uh, about going racing, it would be to develop social connections Yes, and and communication skills. Agreed. Yeah, yeah. it's the, drama it's the classes and, and win, how to win friends it, and influence people. 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because if you can't, um, if if you've got the funding, it's probably not such a big issue. But if you haven't got the funding, you, you you're gonna have to weed it out of someone. Yeah, and the only well, way to do that is to make them feel good about you by great communications. Yeah, and you're and actively gas. actively advertising on their behalf. So if you're a super friendly yeah. guy or girl, and you're out there actively promoting people's brands, talking making connections slash influencing other people to buy their products and yep. t-shirts. You know, you look at the most successful race car drivers, Peter Brock and Craig Lowndes, arguably here in Australia, um, both super friendly guys. And they were selling the mm. most t-shirts, signing the most autographs. And they were the most, you know, successful race car drivers because they were so popular with so many people and they, you know, their sponsors flopped. Yep flocked to those yeah. guys and they were great drivers yeah that's right but you still need to be able to drive if you if you can't drive um sure. you know you, you'll still be able to participate if you got the funding to do it but you're not going to get maybe where you you, you want to yeah 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 you yeah, still need to be able to steer the thing steer the thing yeah so so moving on from um some from kart racing into a bit of your professional career you were working at kart Oswald. what's the relationship there yeah i um um, I was working in the training industry uh -huh. um, at the time, um, working at a private venue, teaching computers and a bit of basic education stuff for um, for, for this organisation in, in Gippsland. And uh, Cart Oz magazine was put together by Ian Silvestrin, who does some of the commentary on the Euro races that you might hear. Okay. The w WSK events. Okay, WSK. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's the commentator. Yeah. Well, he he him and a friend of his, Sean Henschel, would sort of uh, got Card Oz magazine up and running back in, oh God, what was the year? The late nineties, I guess. I can't remember the exact year, and um, and it was a really good, high quality print publication, and they were looking for someone to sort of take on a bit of an editorial role, and uh, I. Uh, ended up getting the job there with them and working full time in a go karting magazine. So I moved out of the training industry, working full time on a go kart magazine, and you know, dream job. <laughs> yeah, sweet. And yeah. had you had any journalism experience before? No, no, not at all. All the only, well, the only experience I had was writing some club newsletters. Okay. Really, and uh, writing a few things there, and uh, doing some race commentary at kart meetings. That that was it. And did you know um, Ian personally, or you just um? No, not at the time. No, no. Oh, sweet. So, um, uh, so yeah, ended, ended up working there for a, a few years, um, and it it changed ownership, and um, and the the world was changing at that point as well because with the internet coming on, yeah, sure. And the magazine got to a point where it wasn't going to continue and and stop printing, and I thought, oh, okay. Um, I really want to sort of stay in this in this game. Uh, I didn't have the funding or the motivation, to be honest, to go and do a print magazine because there's a lot involved. I bet. If you're I'll trying bet. to punch something out every month with deadlines and all of that sort of sure. stuff, and and I, I'm not the sort of person to go chasing heavily on the advertising side of things, which is required to fund a print magazine. Okay. All right. So. I wasn't going to go down that path and the internet was coming up. People were starting to, you know, websites were starting to pop up around the place. So I, I taught myself how to do HTML coding <laughs> and put together a basic website for, uh, for go-karting and uh, threw a few flyers in some people's seats at some race meetings and started getting visits and it sort of just took off from there. So um, the Cartsport news site started, it went live in November, 2004. Yeah, right. So it's, it's coming up uh, nearly 19 years. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Big, big party going yes, down. That's a big house. Time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. So that, that led straight into, yeah, so Car Sport News was born sort of on the backside of Card Oz magazine dying off. Yeah, yeah, sort of yeah. That, just, that's right. Yeah. And, and I should point out that there's been two Cart Oz magazines. I'm talking about the first original, the good one. Okay. Sort of uh, late 90s up to sort of mid 2004 it would have uh -huh. been um when i started the website there was another magazine uh in circulation and once the cart oz that i'd worked for ceased printing yes they changed their title to cart oz magazine oh did they really it did yeah. straight up right there you yep. go yeah it wasn't immediate but they ended okay. up changing the title and uh, and so the the 
title of it lived on for a number of years. Oh, that's um, pretty good then, I suppose. You know, yeah. So, but well, I wasn't involved in, in any of, any of that at all. Nah. Although, nah. having said that, some of my content just kept popping up in their magazine, <laughs> come off the like... website. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, know how that happened, but, that. but anyway, we're scaring, scaring. <laughs> it's all yeah. We'll let it rest. It's all uh, it's all under the water. It's all in the past. It's so. Gone. Yeah, but yeah. that's how I got into the the website is because the print magazine shut down, and uh, I just started uh, started the the Cart Sport News up to you know cover race meetings and things like that, and it kicked off from there. Yeah, and how how um how big is the Cart Sport News um, website? Is it have you got like a is, is it something that just has grown exponentially since you started, or do you find um, the carding numbers sort of dictate? Like it just yeah yeah out. as as the the number of participants have crashed over the last number of I mean they're sort of coming up a bit again now but uh, they crashed there for quite a while and, uh-huh. and I did see that uh, that was reflected in in visits to the site as well sure. uh, the the purpose of the site hasn't changed quite hasn't changed a lot in that it I'll basically publish anything karting related. I don't have the time so much these days, which is frustrating to sit down and do a lot of writing and doing research on articles, proper journalism, haven't been able to do that for quite a while. Uh-huh. Um, but if I can get contributors to put stuff up, if it's about cart racing, I'm happy to happy to print it. Race, you like it. that type of thing, yeah. Yeah. Um, but the thing, it's also changed a lot as well in that uh, the social media has really moved things differently now. So the visits to the, just to the website is less than what it was a number of, like back in the heyday of the sort of the mid 2000 to 2010 ish sort of thing. Because yeah. as social media has come up, your social media audience grows and your website audience comes down. Overall, audience, when you're telling all the numbers, is, is higher than what it's been, but it's a different mix. Yeah. I guess the social media thing has been good for awareness because everyone could see someone's Instagram page or Facebook page or TikTok or whatever. Um, yep. And so, they go, oh, wow, this is the car racing and, it, it, you know, the Netflix series that came out about Formula One. Now everyone's like, oh, Formula One's so awesome. So that's cool too. So now they're like, whoa, shit, well, if we want to get started in Formula One, you've got to start in karting. Well, that's what they all did. So that maybe that's helped with some of the extra uh, sort of traffic to, you know, cart websites and yeah. And, and like yours or and even a power and even with something like the videos with you, that you've been publishing as well you know there's a lot of people new to the sport of stumbling across those part of me and uh, learning learning some key things about the sport without <laughs> having to learn the hard way if you like yeah you look off from an outsider point of view you look at card and go oh wow it's just so technical where do i start but you just start at the beginning like everybody else and you just learn things week in, week out. If you go to the track more times, you become more better, especially if the other guys are not going. So, yeah, it, it does seem like a technical sport. I guess hopefully our videos help break that down a little bit so that it, it doesn't seem as daunting. Um, they're obviously not cutting edge new technologies that I'm you know, spreading out on the interweb for everybody to know. It's more common knowledge but just yeah. putting it together in a, in a simple form so guys, like new guys, um, new guys can get on there and, and get those those easy wins so they can get out on the track a little bit more and, and not be... Yeah, it's just it's, it's an education process because back in the day when I started, there was no there was no YouTube, there were no videos, there was some magazines that sort of printed a few how-tos from time to time. Um but there was, and there were not so much teams that people could join. So the education process, and this was true for carts and car racing. You'd go and buy a cart or buy your Formula Ford or whatever, and typically it would be a lad and their dad sort of deal, and yeah. they would learn over a number of years of what they're doing to get to a point of being a beginner to being to the point of being competitive and a, a, a top runner in their chosen field. Whereas now, um, everything's wanting to happen quickly people wanting to they start off and they want to go well really really early and a lot of people these days don't either don't have the time or don't want to spend the time to learn it themselves uh, and so you, you, you research and learn it whatever other way you can well I, i've always said to the guys and, and i'd love to get your feedback on this is that you need about five or ten years of experience in go-karting 
to really start pushing the boundaries. Because I watch a lot of the guys that are really dominant and they're all, I'm going to say all, but I'm, I shouldn't say all because there's an exception to every rule. But generally speaking, they're the 10-year plus veterans um, <laughs> that are just absolutely dominating and they're really hard to knock off their perch. They've got the knowledge. They've got the skills. They've got all the equipment, everything. They know how to win a race. They know how to win a race meeting. They can put everything together on the day and you've got to try to knock them off. So if you're new to the sport and you just go, oh, yeah, I'm going to go do that and you don't give yourself 10 years, I just don't – I think you just – in my in my opinion, and I'd love to get your opinion, I think you're just not delusional but um, you're being unrealistic in your expectations. Yeah, um, yeah. when you get some of these, I'll call, I'll call them career carters. People yes. have been in the sport and stay yeah. in the sport for a long time, run the same class for years and years and years. Yeah. Always going to be hard to beat. But, I mean, it's good to have a high bar to reach as, as, as well. Agreed. Um, uh, yeah, so I five or ten years, I've never really thought about it, to be honest. Um, I mean, there's, there's, as you said, there's this exceptions. You get someone who comes in who's just got a natural gift for, and feel for what they're doing, and they can start winning races straight away. But and I think you'll agree that most people who come into the sport don't realise how hard it is to get to that consistently top level. Yes. No. <laughs> well, I, I think I look at myself. Jet ski beforehand. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say I, I look at myself, and I've got years of experience, but I don't go. So when I get back in, I can be three, four, five tenths off the pace all day, every day. You know, you put everything on the car, but you you just don't have that last bit. Now, three tenths of a second per lap, you know, and 10-lap wrap is a three-second loss. That's an ass kicking and a big yeah, one. Yeah. And that's to the, you know, the guy saying first. Now, if there's 10 guys, you you or 20 guys at like an AKC, half a second, you, you might you yeah. could be in last place. <laughs> yeah. You're deep. Uh, yeah. And that's been generous. So even with experience, you've got to practice a lot and, and stay in the car. I mean, some of the better drivers, yeah. And uh, when I think of like, say, someone like David Serra, I'm sure he could probably get back in the go-kart tomorrow and be kicking ass because once again, an exception to the rule. But for us mere mortals, uh, if you're not racing all the time, um, you, you... Yeah, there's know. there's no substitute for seat time. Um, I find that, especially now as I'm getting older, uh -huh. the um, I don't get to practice in the cart. So the only time I'm in the seat is at a race day. And I've, I've got to go and do other other things like gym and so on just to with the tyres that we run on now and the grip that's available. Uh, um, and you, you'd need to have a level of fitness just to be able to keep doing it. Yeah, yeah. rib and neck injuries. Have, have you, you've had a go, new, a go on the new uh, LeConte? SVB and SBC tires. Oh, I'm right. right. What, what's the one in KA3? Uh, yeah, uh, LHO3. Yeah, the yeah the sort of medium grip tire. But yeah, yeah. So, and that's been. Um, I, I I run the tires right down until the dots are gone, right? Because I'm okay. doing real budget level club day racing. What more? Sure. What more people should be doing? Yeah, it is. It is. And, and one thing with that Leconte though is the. I mean, all tires fall off as they get old, but I, um. It, it does tend to hold the time a little bit better. So instead of being second off the pace when they're worn out, you, I don't know, half a second, three quarter, whatever, they, yeah. they do hold on a, a bit longer. Um, but, uh, yeah, just and this has evolved over many years. Every time there's new tyre contracts awarded or whatever, we send, tend, send, in general, tend to be going faster and faster and faster. And uh, I think... It doesn't matter so much at AKC level what their tyres are running because everyone's on multiple sets every race meeting anyway. But uh, for the for some of the club level stuff, I think maybe the tyres are a little over gripped. For yeah, maybe what we need. Yeah, especially um, for people who are not in the cart a lot. Correct. Yeah, and and I guess the softer the tyre is, the more critical you've got to be with some of the setup as well. You miss it. You miss it by a reasonable amount. Yeah, you can be a couple or whatever. Of yeah. Off, yeah. The, the thing I'm finding up here, like that we've had some killer weather. It's just Queensland, classic, no wind, sunny days, heaps of people on the track. And the, the yeah. track is tacky. Like it, you walk out on the race line and there's so many. Yeah, yeah, your shoes are sticking to the track. It's awesome. And the lap times have been shaved off maybe another another second a lap quicker. It's almost like the old school Rotax Pro Tour is in town. 
And remember when they, all the Rotax tyres used to go out and they mm. they cut a groove in the track nearly and it was over a second a lap quicker and you, you can't really place why you're so much faster other than there's rubber yeah. on the track and you're driving through the corners quicker. But you just it just happens and you just go, oh, I don't know, I'm just quicker, you know. Yeah. But everyone goes quicker, yeah. But That's it right. Hard. Everyone's there. Yeah. yeah. All your mates have gone quicker too. Yeah, yeah, you're thinking, oh, geez, we're going fast, but we've dropped down the order. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what the heck, man? Yeah. <laughs> Better give this up. Yeah, so that um, – yeah, so that's the those new tires are are excellent, and I, I love driving on. I still get out in the cart and have a, you know, maybe a spin once a month, or something like this, just for yep. you know maybe driving a customer's cart or something like that. But as for the racing, I, you know, I, I don't shy away from it, but it's just a, not on my radar. It just, just life gets in the way. You end up busy with work or your family or whatever. Yeah, and I'm no different. You know, I'd love to be out there burning up tires every weekend but it's just something i haven't got time for all the resources to do really at the moment to do, yeah just yeah. with other things um yeah hey mark uh it's been awesome talking to you today thanks so much for giving us your time um a bit of a throwback a little bit of nostalgia a little bit of car yeah knowledge. Um, Bring up some memories from the past. I haven't yeah. thought about for a while yeah I mean, it was funny talking to you on the phone when we were doing all this up and realizing that you know we had lived so close together in Victoria, but really not really had much of a conversation really before. No, I reached out to you to do the podcast. No, that that's right. As I said before, I normally just I just went racing, blinkered here to yeah. race, not make yeah. friends, yeah. <laughs> sort of deal. <laughs> <For> you guys <laughs> didn't take that much. I mean, yeah, didn't take much notice of what was going on outside of my own race. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're a big deal down at Oakley. The Mark Wicks. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so thanks heaps for your time, man. It's been been awesome. No um, and what we'll do is we'll probably uh, wrap this uh, podcast up for today, unless you've got some final words for the, the fans out there. Stay on the black stuff. <laughs> no, no, that's, <laughs> that's a, a really cliched thing to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I better fall for life. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Mark, uh, you have a good day, and um, uh, thanks. thank you very much for your time. No worries. Thanks for the chance. Cheers. Yeah. But so there you have it. We hope you guys enjoyed the conversation with Mark. Don't forget to check out Cartsport News online at cartsportnews.com and follow him on Instagram and all the other socials at Cartsport News. If you've loved the podcast, why don't you just uh, give us a follow and a five-star rating while you're at it? Just saying, if you're listening on Apple or Spotify. And if you're watching us on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for listening. See you in the next one.